Um, so we're going to talk about puberty, and I think this will tie to some of what Molly talked about and some of what Jono talked about in a little bit of a different way. Um, so as Sherman mentioned, uh, going back to like middle school, um, anybody, show of hands, did anybody ever play a drum cat? I see a couple of hands, amazing. Usually there are no hands if I mention this. <laughs> Swear to God, this is a real thing. Uh, go Google it. This was the beginning of electronic drums. Um, it was a hardware device. And for some reason in middle school, I got really interested in software. I was a musician. I wanted to combine those things. So I started getting chips in the mail and beta testing this hardware. Um, so with that as kind of a launch point, I want to just like um, dive into this awkward stage of life called puberty. And hopefully this brings up some stories for you all. If you're willing to share them with me afterwards, it'll make me feel a little bit better about myself. I'll share one just to set the stage. Um, so for whatever reason, this is like late middle school for me. Um, I went through uh, this stage where I was testing out different outfits. I don't know why, I did. And I was committed to them. Like they would go on for several months at a time. And so I'll just paint a picture of one outfit that I would wear. It's not this. This is another thing I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I would have pulled up a picture of this if I could have found one, but I couldn't. I used to wear black sambas, sweatpants, and argyle wool sweaters. Swear. That was the outfit that I wore. I don't know why I thought that was a good idea, but I did. Needless to say, from my own personal evidence, I believe that puberty is an awkward stage of life. I hope some of you might agree. And what I've learned subsequently since going through that as a human is that that is just as true for startups and it's just as true for emerging technologies, which is where I and we spend most of our time at the CoLab at IDEO. This happens to be in the movie, great movie. You should watch it this weekend. If you haven't seen Goonies, watch it. It's a great walk into puberty and analyzing all sorts of interesting things. So what I want to talk about today is that design is a tool to navigate this. Design is a way, whether you call it design or not, to prototype and iteratively learn very quickly in the world. And had I known this back then, I probably would have stopped wearing sweatpants and sweaters very quickly. So um, I want to take you through a few examples of where we've kind of navigated this. And I'll start with a pre-puberty story. So I'm sure most of you, probably all of you, know PillPack, recent amazing story for Boston. I'm going to rewind to 2013. So go back to 2013, and we met two amazing founders, TJ and Elliot who had an amazing concept. They had an amazing pill packing robot. And they came and moved into IDEO over in Central Square for three months to be a startup in residence. This was the early stages of a journey that led them to be a design-led organization. And I don't think that's trivial at all. If you think about pharmacies and the pharma and pharmacy experience, I imagine that words that come to mind are frustrating, complicated, opaque. And what I believe is true, if you look at this photo, is that you see a juxtaposition to that. You see an experience which is not anything extra. It's simple, it's streamlined, it's accessible. And that ultimately, I believe, has been PillPack's secret weapon, and I hope it continues to be differentiating themselves in an otherwise very crowded and intimidating area. But I don't want to just talk about design as an output. I actually want to focus on the process. So what you see on the right-hand side here is TJ. He's up at a uh, mall on the North Shore. Um, with some other people from our team and his, and they were running a live prototype. And they wanted to learn about a lot of things that day. They wanted to test price point. They wanted to understand messaging. But one of the stories from that day stands out to me, which is that people would come up and they'd start interacting with uh, TJ, in this case, or others, and they would have this assumption that this was an add-on service. It was something that was going to be piled on top of their current pharmacy, which is a simple thing piled on top of a complicated thing, and that doesn't make it less complicated. In reality, TJ's a pharmacist. They were building a pharmacy. This was a moment of saying, we need to declare that we are a pharmacy, and we're going to replace other pharmacy experiences, helping them figure out how they wanted to show up in the world. Now, um, if we think about design moving on from startups, let's think about emerging technologies. And I imagine there are a lot of startups in the room that are both of these. You're using emerging technologies, and you are a startup. Design, I believe, tends toward the edges of technologies. So on one hand, we have very, very young technologies, like shown in this great show, Westworld. And we use design as a tool, usually design fiction and prototyping, to show how those technologies might come to life, to show what their capabilities may be. On the other side, we have very mature technologies. We have things like Bluetooth. And the role that design plays here is to figure out how those technologies can be applied and do sort of fine detail design, like in the case of wireless speakers. But design is just as important and I think often missed in the middle ground when we're going through this adolescent phase, this stage of puberty. And if I 
think about some of the startups that are in here that I know of, and I imagine there are more, you're dealing with things like blockchain, you're dealing with things like artificial intelligence, you're dealing with things like augmented or virtual reality. And you need to figure out both what those capabilities are, and they keep changing, and you also need to figure out how they're gonna show up in the world. So I wanna walk you through just a couple of examples of um, work that we've done or other inspiration in the world. First one um, is a company called Augur. Augur is building a protocol for decentralized prediction markets. This is just a screen grab of, uh, if you log into Augur now, what you'll see. And I wanna mention a couple of things about this. So this is both of these things. It's a perfect example where they have a blockchain backend, which is continuing to emerge and change as they move forward. And they're also developing a new product. Not a lot of people in the world are participating in prediction markets today. So there's a lot to figure out. First thing I wanna point out is how you engage in this. So most people who are participating in markets actively are like active traders and they're used to dealing with trading terminals. This couldn't look like a trading terminal. These are prediction markets for things like outcomes of political elections or outcomes of sporting tournaments. They mean, needed to make this more accessible to people. So prototyping new ways of using a card format, simple language, simple tags, was a way in to start to make this more accessible to folks. Similarly, you have this notion of decentralized oracles which is an important part of how you settle these markets. You have people that are gonna come in and report on the outcome of an election or a sporting event or data sources, and you need to arbitrate those in some way. So this is a notion of thinking about how do you report and how do you dispute on these outcomes? And this was an interesting technological versus experience discussion of techn technically, we wanted to actually draw this out over a period of time. People wanted to start to settle these markets very quickly. So we had to think, think of what's the clearing period for these and how do people report on them? And this is just a screen back grab of what's live now and will continue to be iterated. The second one I wanna mention, um, this is not work that we've done, but this is a product that I have in my home. Does anybody have a sense in their home? one person, so really cool product, and I hope you'd agree with me when you look at this, that this is a product that this team put time into designing. It's a really nice, and if you held it in your hand, feels really solid, a really beautifully executed product. What's interesting about this, though, is that you get this in the mail, you hand it to an electrician, it gets installed in your circuit breaker panel, and you never see it again. Begs the question of why. What this does, is it senses the electrical patterns in your house and it reports out to you what devices are on, what devices are off, what those devices are. It's basically monitoring the electrical heartbeat of your house. As a consumer, that scared me a little bit, but I felt actually more comfortable knowing that this team was super thoughtful in all of the things that that hard work communicated to me. So that's my assumption. I have not asked the team, but it's something that I perceived as a customer. The other thing that I would say, and why this is a great example of literally a startup pushing merging tech through puberty, is this has a massive machine learning platform underneath it. So on the right, you see the app. You can see that it's detected some devices. If you continue to scroll down there, you would see unknowns. These are devices that their algorithm has not figured out yet. They invite you in, if you click on those, to come and contribute what make, what model that device is so that they can help inform their algorithm. They're showing you that this thing is developing. So to come full circle and with uh, a project that we did earlier this year with PillPack, this was a project that we did with their uh, data science team thinking about customer churn. Not like many organizations that are at their size and growing as quickly as they do, as they are. Uh, they have an enormous amount of data and they have a fantastic data science team. But one of the things that that team is trying to figure out with this new set of capabilities and technologies is how do I make this understandable and accessible to the rest of the organization? So we started to prototype tools, Ultimately, looking like a proof of concept that we built like this, it was actually a functioning, uh, functioning product where customer service reps or marketing managers or others in the organization could go in and start to create user personas based upon real customer data, start to adjust attributes that the customer might encounter in the course of their experience with PillPack and start to get back meaningful, actionable data. So the outcome of this, what was so fascinating is that these data scientists were amazing. They were producing wonderful output. They always got stuck in these conversations about how they get people to engage. See people down in front of this tool who are not data scientists, and in two minutes, they're interacting and playing with that technology that's trying to mature. So with that, um, I will hopefully land the plane. Hopefully there are some patterns that have stuck with you across that. Um, my belief here is that design is an underused tool. Prototyping is an underused tool when you're trying to navigate this stage of puberty. And fundamentally, it is a capability to understand what capabilities you're working with, especially as they're changing in the case of emerging technology, and figure out how you're gonna show those up in the world. 
Uh, if you haven't seen Unis, I recommend that you watch it this weekend. There's also a little peek into emerging technologies, which are not so emerging anymore. Thank you.